Okay. Let me share the screen. This is what I did last time. So I'm hoping that this works. We'll see. Stop share, just share. You grab the thing. Okay. All right, so, um, so we're gonna do chapter nine, uh, participation campaigns and elections. So, um, so this image says that in 2019, Seattle City Council candidate Sean Scott was able to use the Seattle Democracy Voucher Program to help publicly fund his campaign. Though he ultimately lost the election, these programs aim to enable candidates of all economic statuses and backgrounds to run successful campaigns for public office. So running for office is incredibly expensive and a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, like the last couple of presidential campaigns have like each side has raised in the billion dollar range, billion. Like we could solve hunger, like we could end homelessness, but no, let's pay for TV ads. So, um, so a lot of people obviously don't have those funds. They don't have those sort of connections. Um, they don't have a house to like mortgage to, you know, run for city council or whatever. So it's nice to have these sort of programs in place to help with that. Um, so, you know, like we've talked about all semester political participation is more than just um, showing up at the polls, you know, like that's obviously the number one thing you need to be able to vote and be informed when you do so. But it's also participating in other activities that um, make the world go around for our political process. So, um, for example, it talks about attending campaign events, rallies, fundraisers, contributing money to candidates or to causes that are near and dear to your heart, um, to political parties as well, contacting your elected officials, whether it be at the local level, like your city mayor, or at the national level, like your US Congress person, um, working for candidates and campaigns that you're passionate about, that is a very thankless and broke job. I promise you will not make a lot of money working on the crown level of a campaign, but it's also incredible work. Um, if you're really, really passionate for that individual or that cause. Um, canvassing voters as far as like, hey, who are you planning on voting for? Um, you know, are you registered to vote? Can I get you to volunteer? That kind of thing. Um, putting campaign signs in your yard. It's a great way to anger all of your neighbors <laughs> and, uh, and to see who, who you like as a neighbor and who you don't like as a neighbor. Um, and, uh, and then signing political petitions. So um, one way that people can get on the ballot is to either pay a qualifying fee or to get enough petition signatures to get their name added to the ballot. You still have to pay per petition, but it's only 10 cent per petition where like the qualifying fee is a much larger number and that number varies depending on what seat you're running for. It's a lot more affordable to run by petition. Used to, it was considered like low class, like trashy to some extent to like qualify by petition because, oh, like you can't afford the qualifying fee. And now it's just the opposite because people see it as Oh, you're too good to get out and talk to your constituents that you want to run for and have them sign petitions. So now it's the preferred method of most people to qualify to run for office by petition um, or to get like issues on the ballot as well, like medical marijuana. Like that was one that like they got enough petitions to put on the ballot. Um, and so these are all different forms of political participation. Protests, demonstrations, strikes are also means. Um, a lot of people are uncomfortable with this. It's obviously, it's very in your face. It's very like you're putting yourself out there in a way that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. It's really easy to be like passive aggressive and be like, here's my sign, here's my purse. If you don't like it too bad, but this is what I'm voting for as opposed to like being on the street corner, like with the signs and yelling at like traffic as it goes by, right? So um, so everybody is different in their comfort level, but most people are 
more comfortable with the passive means of participation as opposed to the kind of like in your face. So a lot of Americans participate through the peaceful protests, like we've talked before, strikes and other demonstrations. So one of the things that your chapter seven uh, media chapter talks about and shows an example of is the peaceful protests that happened during the civil rights movement where there were like sit-ins and silent, like just sitting on a sidewalk, sitting in a building or whatever. Um, and then the government a lot of times would be very violent with them to try and remove them from the area. Um, they would turn fire hoses on them, all kinds of things to try and stop them, even though it was a constitutionally protected right. So, and of course, it's very important to understand that it's peaceful protests that are protected. But if you start endangering other people, you start destroying property, then the police powers that the constitution induces to the um, local communities, then that kicks in for them to be able to protect the community from that kind of like ruckusness. Is that word ruckusness? <laughs> um, so it's definitely important in times of history when like people's rights were being restricted, like the right to vote, um, when only white land, land owning males were able to vote, not women, not minorities. Um, and it's still very relevant today, as we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, as we've seen with a lot of things that have been happening in the last decade or so with the LGBT equality fight, the same sex marriage, all of that. Um, it's definitely a very important part of our process. Um, a lot of people will be pulled sometimes and be uncomfortable with protests, but a lot of that has to do with not being a very informed individual and they don't understand all of our constitutional rights. Um, and they don't realize that like peaceful protests are guaranteed and protected as and listed as part of our protections under the constitution. So here are some different forms of participation. Can everybody see that okay? Um, so like we've talked about before, voting is the easiest like number one thing that people do to participate in elections. Um, but it's not just enough to show up at the polls and vote for the yard signs you saw the most. Like you really wanna do your homework and be informed and understand what that person's platform is and whether or not it lines up with your political views before you step into the voting booth. Uh, the next option is publicly express support for a candidate on social media. That didn't used to be, yes. Yeah, which a lot of people go, what? <laughs> So, and that, that is a shame. Like a lot of people feel like, well, that's not right. But that's part of the reason why we have the elections. Like, oh, well, you didn't do what you said you were gonna do, or you didn't even attempt. Like you got in office and you were totally someone different. That's but when you fire them at the next election. I recently saw that, of course, you specified like brand. One of the things is like, he's against offshore drilling down part of the platform. Yeah. He just like had a he had a bit like somebody submitted one. Well, just because somebody submitted one doesn't mean that he's accepting it. I... Hmm. I have to look into that and see. I haven't heard anything about that. The big thing that they've been talking about lately, uh, one of the things that um, his administration is doing, and I actually talk about it in the recording, is um, there's like a way that you can get subsidy help for high-speed internet, um, depending on your income level and things like that to try and help like equal um, the playing field for that because everything is online, right? Like job applications, you can even apply for assistance or like unemployment or WIC or food stamps or whatever without the internet. Like <laughs> You have to either go into the office and use their computer and internet or you have to be able to do it at home. Um, and so that's something they've been talking about in the news. And then today he just had a live press conference regarding the cost of fuel 
um, and he is going to dip into the reserve to try and lower prices because the oil companies have said that they're not going to increase production, like they're not going to drill more than what they normally do. And so that's part of the reason why the fuel is up and it's up everywhere. I mean, there are places where it's like 550 a gallon right now, which is crazy. Yes. So, uh, they might be and some places overseas they were talking about too. I miss, I was, I don't know. Oh, I was doing, Oh, I had a zoom meeting with a student. So I missed part of the conference. So I came in on part of it. Um, and so he's, dipping into that to try and help lower it, but that's a temporary solution. And it doesn't solve our long-term problem on only so many dinosaur fossils in the ground. Whenever we use them up, we use them up and then we have no fossil fuel, <laughs> which we are largely dependent on. So in his press conference, he also discussed again, like reiterating the need to start looking at alternatives. So, um, so, but I will have to look at the offshore drilling because I haven't heard anything about that, but I'll definitely check for sure. Um, so the social media thing is a big deal now, right? Like used to, that wasn't even an issue, you know, like, I mean, Facebook is how many years old? Like I was in Gulf Coast when it was starting to get a big deal in like 06, 07. Um, and then it was MySpace before that. Um, so, but now it's a really big deal and it's an effective way to get people's attention. And a lot of the studies are showing that people do pay attention to what people are posting and they are reading how like their peers feel about certain issues and it can influence people to at least pay more attention and to kind of do the research themselves as well. So um, the next um, way that a lot of people participate is contacting an elected official, which is a phenomenal way to be engaged and to make sure that your voice is heard because they log all of that and they track the type of people that they're hearing from, like as far as like demographics, age, race, that kind of thing, to see like, hey, these people and this particular segment of my constituents care about this issue, so I need to care about this issue. Um, attending a local government meeting, that's not as common. And a lot of that simply has to do with the fact that it's in the day when everybody's at work, right? Like all the government meetings are like noon or 11 o'clock or something, like nobody's able to attend that. Um, so that's a problem unless there's like an evening town hall or something. Um, contributing money to a campaign is another way that people can support. It's not as common because, you know, people don't have money to be able to do that. Um, but like we've discussed before, campaigns now are going the route of what the Obama campaign started in 08, which is like any dollar amount, like one, two, three dollars, it doesn't matter. This will help us get to our goal. And so a lot of campaigns are going that way now. And um, so you're seeing more people donate because they don't feel the pressure to donate large sums. Um, right next to that, like very close, these three items are for attending a political rally or event. And then the least way is to work or volunteer for a campaign. It's a huge commitment to be a staff member on a campaign. You're talking 16 to 20 hour days of working and then going home for like a nap and then coming right back to it. Um, I have pictures of me at the end of a campaign and I just look unhuman. <laughs> I'm on death's door. I need to be hooked up to fluids. It's a mess. Um, it's, a, it's very difficult and it's not for a lot of people. Um, you have a lot of time away from your loved ones. Um, people who like work on campaigns professionally for a living never have like a consistent place to be home. They're on the road all the time. They're constantly going all over the place and it's great and it's, and it's energetic and it's lively and it's, it's really unique, but it's also super exhausting and trying on the body and on the people you care about. So, so it's definitely not as popular of an option. <clears throat> so, um, so we're going to break down the different types of participation. The first one being voting. So obviously that's a traditional form. Um, it's the most important one for us as Americans. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, um, you know, with our democracy, with the way that we're set up, if we don't participate in the elections, then our entire process falls apart, right? Like the whole process starts with choosing people to lead our 
government at all levels. So, um, you know, we've talked about suffrage before, you know, that's the right to vote and the suffrage movement that different groups put forth, African Americans and women. There have been a lot of groups, all except for white males who have had to fight for the right to vote. Um, and so that has continued to expand for more and more people throughout history to where it's been more and more inclusive. And so that has, <clears throat> that has worked well. It's a shame that we've had to do it in the way that we've done it, but you know, you learn from your mistakes and you grow and, and hopefully you become better. So um, like we've discussed previously, African-American men got the right to vote after the Civil War. The Jim Crow laws were put in place to make it difficult and to try and find ways around um, allowing them to vote and trying to find ways to block that effort um, with different things like like the, the du, jour, du jour segregation and um, you know literacy tests and poll taxes and all of those things that we talked about during the civil rights chapter. But the Voting Rights Act of 1965 ended all of that and made all of that illegal. So um, those sort of discriminatory practices wouldn't be allowed anymore and stop people from voting. And then women, of course, won the right to vote in 1920 through the 19th Amendment, which we've talked about a lot. You guys wrote a whole essay on it, so no need to dive into that too much more. The most recent expansion of the right to vote was the 26th Amendment, where the voting age dropped from 21 to 18. And we've talked about that before as well. That was during Vietnam. Um, and that was because of the draft. People were fussing that they couldn't vote, but yet they could go and fight for our country. So they lowered the age to where people could do both. So um, on page 255, you'll see figure 9.2, voter turnout in presidential and midterm elections. So this says, since the 1890s, participation in elections has declined substantially, with the exception of the 2020 election. One pattern is consistent across time. More Americans tend to vote in presidential election years than in years when only congressional and local elections are held. Um, and then it asks, what are some of the reasons that participation rose and fell during the last century and then rose again in 2020? So, um, and we've talked about this before too, right? There are a lot of people who are not as informed who think the presidential election is the end all be all and it's the most important. And it's not that it's not important, but a lot of people don't realize how important the local elections are. Really your local officials affect you on a day-to-day -day basis on a much larger scale than the president does. You know, like your local officials decide how your water runoff is gonna be done, when the roads get repaved, how all of those things and those inner workings for the day-to-day -day dealings in your city and your county those are the people that make those calls. Those are the ones that help determine your taxes and your property value and that kind of thing. And so all of that actually matters on a day-to-day -day basis much more than the presidency. Uh, but a lot of people feel like the presidency matters so much because of the, the big issues, right? Like wartime and, um, and decisions that are to be made like on a global scale that can impact our economy and those sort of things. So obviously an important position to vote for, but the other positions are also important. But the average voter doesn't realize that. There are a lot of people, you look at their voting record and they only vote once every four years and it's for president. And a lot of the times they'll only vote for that race and they leave everything else blank. And it kills me. Like you're already right there. Like just finish it, finish the ballot, but a lot of people aren't even familiar with what else is on the ballot because they don't do their homework because the media just focuses on, or not just focuses, but largely focuses on the presidential race. So even when your local news talks about other races, people aren't paying attention to that as much as they are for the presidential race. And then the 2020 election was such a big deal with the coronavirus pandemic that a lot of people were concerned about how we were going to be moving forward as a society for our safety and health and all of that. Um, and the way things were being altered with our economy because of it and employment. So we saw a big uptick in 2020 of turnout because there were such large issues, not your standard issues that we hear every presidential election of abortion rights and gun rights and all the things that have literally already been established multiple times by the Supreme Court, but like real new serious issues and um, 
And so a lot of people showed up because they were very concerned with what was going on. So um, now your media chapter talks about this as well. And we've talked as well about online participation. So digital participation has become a really big deal in the last decade. Um, so you know, newspapers have gone online your television, your radio stations will direct you if you listen to them, oh, visit our website for more information at you know, www.whatever.com, right? Um, and so a lot of people are starting to pay more attention to the news online, like they're participating politically online. There's so much that's changing and the digital age is affecting the process for so much of that, that it really is at the forefront, like the technology changes are at the forefront of so much that have to do with like our day to day aspects. So digital political participation is considered to be activities designed to influence politics using the internet, um, including visiting a candidate's website, organizing events online, signing an online petition. Um, the internet gives us a lot of access to information about candidates and issues that matter and platforms um, and has a large role in it. And the issue, and we discussed this um, with chapter seven as well, is being sure that you're not getting bogged down with the, the falsehoods that can happen online as well. Because anybody with the internet, with with any knowledge at all for it can put together a website, put together a blog, put out information. And then you've got to like weed through that and know what is legitimate and what is not. Um, so digital participation is currently the most common way that people participate aside from voting, um, you know, sharing their viewpoint, sharing their information about their candidate, sharing how they feel about something on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, even LinkedIn, like, your know, LinkedIn is mostly a professional like platform, but a lot of people post information that they feel like intercedes that's important with the workforce, um, you know, uh, minimum wage and leave and uh, maternity and paternity leave and family leave and all that kind of stuff. Even though um, that's a political matter. It also affects the workforce. So a lot, you see a lot of that on LinkedIn as well. Um, so social connections are very important for participation and social media helps with that running campaigns. Like you have to have like a social media account. Like if you're a candidate, you've got to be out there on social media as well, putting your information just like you would on your website. Um, and like more so even than like mailing out you know, mail pieces or, you know, phone calls, like, like the online presence is really hitting home in a different sort of way where people feel safe to participate without as much direct interaction, unfortunately, you know, like a lot of people are more comfortable to respond to something online than over the phone, you know, more and more people are like, can you just text me? Like, I, I really, I don't want to talk on the phone, right? So um, little acts of participation, like sharing a news story or following a candidate makes a really large difference down the road. It can show the campaign where they stand, that it can tell them who to target. It can tell them who not to target. Um, they it can tell them, you know, based on people's reactions to things they put out there about their platform issues, what's popular, what's not, how people feel about different situations. So digital participation is a very big deal now. Um, so the next thing that your book talks about is socioeconomic status. And we talked about that a little bit before um, with the public opinions chapter. So socioeconomic status is the status in society based on your level of education, income, and occupation, which we had discussed before. So people are more likely to vote if they have higher levels of education um, or higher levels of income. But education is typically the number one like factor in how much they participate. Um, it's the most important factor for predicting turnout. Now, obviously, like my, my mother, she only has a high school diploma. She votes in every election. She's very engaged. That's more of like an age situation. Like older people tend to be really involved. Um, and she's always paid a lot of attention. But a lot of the time, people with less education 
don't know as much about the issues. They're not as informed. So they're less likely to go to the polls because they are not as comfortable with what they have to vote on. Um, so it encourages a lot of people to vote and support an issue and to make a donation. Um, the people who are the higher educated do that. They donate more, they encourage people to donate more, they encourage people to be involved. So it's not even like a direct, people with more education vote more, people with education educate people more, if that makes sense, right? Like, you know, you've got that uncle who like didn't finish school, went to work young, whatever, and then you're sitting there having a conversation, they don't understand a topic, and you're able to help break them down, break it down for them, right? And then they're like, oh, I am, that's not as difficult as I thought it would be, right? And it makes it a little easier for them to show up at the polls because they feel more comfortable with the material because people who don't feel comfortable with it don't want to show up and feel like other people can tell you know like a lot of people feel like oh people are going to think I'm an idiot like I don't I don't want people to think I'm dumb so I'm just not going to do it I'm going to let other people do it so the people who have more education who understand the issues better can help spread that knowledge accordingly as well so um age right like we just talked about and we've talked about this before Older people are more likely to vote. They've got the time. Um, younger individuals don't have as much interest in politics and they haven't been mobilized. Nobody's reached out to them, right? Like people aren't reaching out to high school kids. They're reaching out to the seniors. They're reaching out to the people who are established families because they are the ones who have always voted. But it's catch 22, they've always voted and the younger people haven't because younger people haven't been mobilized to do it. So, um, a lot of campaigns have started the process in the last decade or so of really trying to reach out to younger voters and to get them engaged because it's an un untapped resource, right? Like if a candidate takes the time to reach out to you and you don't hear from the other person, who are you likely to vote for? The person who ca cared enough to reach out to you. Um, there's a program called Rock the Vote and they specifically focus on younger people to try and get people registered to vote. Um, I actually had it in my head to print off voter registration forms and hand them out for anybody who was interested, and then I completely forgot about it, but I plan on doing that next week, and then if anybody is interested, then you already have it, and it's just one less step for you. Um, so, so a lot of younger people, I believe, would be more engaged if they understood the situations better, if they understood the topics, if they had more knowledge and if people were engaging with them um but they don't so they don't right um so that definitely impacts what the government focuses on right we've talked about that before if people who are going into college and having student loan debt aren't voting then what does it matter what they put the student the interest rate at what does it matter if they impact um apartment rentals which are more likely younger people who are just now starting out. What does it matter if they don't give benefits to people who are working 30 hours a week or whatever, because they're, you know, college students or whatever, you know, if you don't get out and vote, then the politicians and the government and the elected officials don't care as much about you as they do the people who help get them in office. They care about the people who are gonna keep their job so for you, if you want them to care about you and to make sure that they don't screw you over with their policies, then you have to be showing up and you have to be in their face and you have to be voting and you have to be engaged. Um, so that implicates quite a bit down the road. Even though a lot of time and effort is spent mobilizing young voters, people who actually vote uh, tend to be older than the average American. So those are your retired folks, right? They got nothing but time. They watch the news at every segment that comes on. They read the paper. They're out in the community. They prefer to drive from place to place to pay all their bills because they got nothing but time. <laughs> My mom falls in that category. She likes to go and pay her bills in person. And I'm like, you have a phone <laughs> with internet. I can show you. She, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't want to waste that kind of gas, but that's that's your call. And a lot of people are like that. So they've got the time to devote. They've got the time to stand in line on election day because 
they they have nowhere else to be, right? So they're good with taking that time. So um, so those people are definitely targeted. That's why you don't see things like social security and retirement and Medicare, like they don't mess with that, right? Because it'll get them out of a job. <laughs> like they know that those people show up and vote and they don't wanna mess with something that impacts them. So, so that affects quite a lot of things. So race and ethnicity, which we've discussed in the past, um, uh, impact you because it gives you different life experiences. We talked about that a lot in chapter six. So um, the first group that it discusses is African-Americans, obviously denied voting for generations. So um, they are, they're very active as a general rule for voter turnout. Um, on like a personal obligation to make up for what their ancestors were not privy to do. Um, so your book talks about how concentrated poverty um, and that de facto segregation we talked about can impact how people vote and what they tend to focus on. It tends to be a barrier for participation, um, but they're still more likely to vote than white people in a similar situation. So, you know, if like African-Americans are, like if there's an African-American in like a lower socioeconomic status, you know, they're struggling a little more financially and someone who's white doing the same thing, the African-American is more likely to vote. Um, and it's just a generational obligation um, to make sure that their rights aren't trampled on again as they were previously. Um, African-Americans largely vote pretty cohesively, um, largely Democrat. They're, very, they're definitely a powerhouse as a group. Um, and so there's always a lot of effort to make sure that that population by the Democratic Party is showing up to the polls and voting. And then the Republican Party is constantly working to um, like pull them away and, and get some of their support because they are such a large voting bloc. Um, white people is the next group, so uh, people who are non-Hispanic, so seven in 10 voters fall in that category in 2016. This group tends to vote Republican. 59% um, voted for Mitt Romney in 2012 and 57% for Donald Trump. Um, lar but the divide tends to fall along educational lines. People with more college um, education tend to vote more Democrat if they're white um, and they vote at higher rates. People without a college degree tend to vote more Republican and are less likely to vote. That's just the way the stats fall. Um, but in 2016, Donald Trump mobili mobilized a lot of people who weren't as educated and people who were of lower income to turn out to the polls in a way that they hadn't before because he targeted a pretty untapped group and it turned out to be successful for him in 16. It wasn't enough in 2020, but in 2016, it definitely proved to be effective. Um, so Latinos and Latinas, 95% uh, of Latinos identify racially as white. They have a separate ethnic identity. Um, so they compose a large portion of population, but they don't have a large group of people voting. And some of that is like immigration status and their um, citizenship status, but they're the largest and fastest growing minority group in the United States. So um, a lot of groups have been trying to target them to, to get them registered to vote if they're citizens, to get them their citizenship if they aren't, and then get them to register and vote. Um, and so we've seen that with the numbers continually increasing. So it's, it's a very large group that political parties would be fools to ignore because it is such a fast growing population group. So if political parties are smart, they will target them and try to persuade them to be on their side basically. So Asian Americans, um, large political group as well, or I'm sorry, large demographic group, um, a lot in California. We talked about that before when we had like the gold rush and we were doing a lot of the mining. Um, a lot of the immigration that came on the West was the Asian community. Um, 
So they have similar voting levels to Latinos. They don't have as large of a turnout um, for the same kind of reasons. But um, it's been very, very difficult to pigeonhole them as some of these other categories have been um, because they are a very diverse group. They don't consider themselves like in one particular category or another. So it makes it very hard for the political parties to target them because you can't, you can't kind of throw them all in a box and say, okay, well, based on all of these things, they're likely to vote X. Um, and so that makes it hard to target them to try and get them to be more engaged. So we've talked about gender before and the gender gap which is a distinctive pattern of voting behavior reflecting the differences in views between men and women. So um, women register at rates similar to men, but are more likely to vote than men. They're much more engaged in the process than men are. Um, and we talked about this before, men are more likely to vote Republican at a higher rate. Women are more likely to vote Democrat at a higher rate. Um, you see about 10 points um, in elections, 13 point, I'm sorry, 13% in the 2016 election as far as the gap of like who is showing up to polls, um, you know, women to men. Um, and you know, we talked about uh, some of that before, some of that, um, that stat that they're feeling is the case is because of the same sort of, you know, women had to fight with the suffrage movement and had different sort of struggles. And um, during all of that, it, the Democratic Party was the one that kind of helped with that movement, just like during the civil rights movement. And so there's kind of a falling in support of that. But that's not always the case, right? Like, you know, I'm sure you know, women who vote Republican, men who vote males, you know, and all of these are are the generalizations based on the numbers, but are not obviously like an end all be all. So, and we've talked about religion before as well, that plays a very large role for people who are religious. Um, it's very important. A lot of times it's what leads everything else that's done. It's what makes all of your other values matter and it all connects back to your religion if you're very religious. So um, groups like African-American churches focus a lot on political participation and voting and registering to vote and they'll, they have politicians come and speak and they, you know, support um, rallies and all kinds of things. Um, the uh, American Jewish Congress and uh, white evangelical organizations, all of those groups like Religion is so organized, right? So they're a great ally for politics because they know how to rally the masses. Um, and so they can encourage their people to vote or to vote a particular way as well. That's definitely something that happens. Um, for a lot of people, one's pastor is a leader that they go to for advice in multiple areas of their life and they're willing to trust them on their political opinion as well as other things. And so when a, a minister encourages a particular candidate over another, the very devout of that church a lot of times follow suit with that. So they're definitely a very powerful political group. Um, when they organize for that. Um, so white evangelicals are typically um, in alignment with the Republican Party, the American African American churches typically with the Democratic Party, um, the Jewish community is uh, somewhere in between. Um, and of course, when you're not religious, it's the opposite. Like, uh, you know, when somebody's not religious, it's sometimes is a turnoff if that's all you hear the party platform or the candidate talk about is their religious aspect because that doesn't apply to the non-religious and they need to hear you know what you're planning on doing in your job and so um so it's like it's a balancing act they they have to cater to the audience in front of them at all times so um we've had a lot of changes to the electoral ruling process over time um so this image shows that um this was a, um, 
a polling place. And so this was people in line to be able to vote. So elections are the most important way that Americans participate in politics. Some of the rules of elections have changed over time. The image on the left show African-Americans voting for the first time in Wilcox County, Alabama, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And the image on the right is an 18 year old woman registering to vote in Illinois after the 26th amendment was passed in 1971, lowering the voting age from 21 to 18. So obviously like these are really significant moments. We've talked about these quite a lot in the class. Um, and those sort of changes really revolutionized the voting process and who was showing up to the polls. It was very important for people, yes. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens with that is the governor of that state appoints somebody to that position. Um, yeah, until the term is up. Um, in theory, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you would hope it would be somebody already engaged in the process, somebody who people are already familiar with. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes that's not the case. You're talking about DeSantis, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so with governor, that would, um, I believe, and I would have to double check this, but I believe the way it would work is the president would have to appoint like a temporary governor. Well, actually, no, the lieutenant governor would, would step in. That's what it would be. The lieutenant governor would step in until the next election. If like the guy or or like in the situation with Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York, you know, he had to step down because of his improprieties. And so then the vice, not vice, lieutenant governor stepped up into the governor role, which in turn made her the first female governor of New York. As opposed to vice. Yeah because they like to be difficult. <laughs> to me, that's crazy. Governor and Lieutenant Governor, President, Vice President should be the same. Okay. Lieutenant President or Vice Governor. <laughs> yeah. Yes, every state has a Lieutenant Governor to replace, because um, yes, yeah, everybody does. So like, or if somebody got sick, somebody got uh, ill and passed away, God forbid, in position, then like the Lieutenant Governor would step into that position, just like the Vice President would step in if like the President were assassinated or something. So, awesome. So, um, so we've talked about voter registration before. See, this is why I wanted to bring the registration forms and I completely forgot. I had one printed out, I was gonna make copies and I did not do that. So, um, so there, I don't have it with me. I left it at home. <laughs> yeah, but I can't print it from here. There's, I don't have a way to like connect to a, I don't know how to do all that from here. I'll bring it next Tuesday, it'll be fine. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of people get confused with the different types of elections we have, right? So everybody's pretty familiar with the fight, with the presidential election, it's every four years, um, even numbered years. So we just had one in 2020, we'll have another one in 2024 you will start seeing people running for office next year for 2024. Yeah, it never ends. It really is a cycle that never ends. Um, so in between that, like during a non-presidential year, it's called midterm elections. So that's your like 2022, 2026 races. So um, a lot of times governors are then, some senators, some not senators, some of the House of Representatives. So um, so basically a midterm is the general election that doesn't fall with the presidential election. So um, we have elections every two years and um, the city elections are different and that depends on the city. Some cities are every two, some are every four, um, but there are elections every two years. Um, so the primary election 
and it's really important for closed primary states like Florida, that's when the political party members, like constituents, choose who they want to go on to the general election. Like if you've got a couple of Democrats, you've got a couple of Republicans, then that same political party like gets the ballot in the primary, they narrow it down to one person, that person goes on to the general as their representative. So if you have like open primary states and it's done a little differently, um, where like, it, I think it's just the top folks like go on to the general, um, but Florida is a closed primary state. Used to more states were closed primary states than open, but that's not the case anymore. We're actually in the minority. Um, more people are either open primary or like have a mix, which is super complicated. Um, so, so anyway, so we're a closed primary state, uh, open primary, wait till the day of the primary to choose which party to enroll in to select candidates, which is also convoluted, right? So open primary means you can vote for whichever one you want, but you have to say, I want a Democrat ballot or I want a Republican ballot. So you don't really because you have to like, you still only have that ticket of candidates for different races. So it's not like you have all the candidates and you can choose like Democrat here and Republican here and Democrat here, or, you know, whatever, whatever. It's you ask for, I want the Democrat ballot, I want the Republican ballot. So equally convoluted system as close primary, if you ask me. Um, and then some people have caucuses, which are basically business meetings to select candidates. Very few areas have caucuses, like Iowa has like a caucus that they do instead of a true like presidential preference primary, there's just a little different. Um, and then the general election is what follows the primary elections and chooses the final people to be elected to office. So like the primaries are always in August and then the general elections are in November. And then the presidential preference ones where we're just doing president, is like the beginning of that presidential year. And it depends on the state that you're in. It could be January, February, March. I think there are even a few April presidential primaries. Um, and the reason why it's staggered is so the candidates have time to go to each state and like campaign. So um, each state has varying electoral laws that dictate how their elections work. Um, that create barriers for voting, all states implement voting and election laws differently, which is frustrating to a lot of people because they don't realize that it's not connected state to state. So when they move, they don't think that they need to do a new registration and then they're upset when they go to vote and they're not in the system. Um, so reg registration requirements also vary by state and reduce turnout because people who don't pay attention and don't know if there's a deadline then they wanna go and vote after the deadline. And if they're not registered to vote, all they can do is register and wait till the next election. So that lowers turnout for the states that have that. Not all states have that. There are some states that allow you to register and vote on the same day. Florida is not one of those. Florida requires that you register to vote 29 days before an election to be able to vote in that election. Um, so there are a lot of impact on young people because they don't know. They're not as informed about all of these situations. So then they're less likely to have their stuff together by the time an election comes around. Um, so one big reform has been encouraging same day registration that a lot of states do. Florida has not gotten on that bandwagon, but a lot of states have been doing that. Um, and then some states do what's called automatic voter registration, where like you get a driver's license in that state, you are a state issued ID, you automatically get registered to vote. Not everybody does that. Some people do. Um, people have different feelings about that. It's just a preference for each state. So, um, so the voter ID law, we talked a little bit about that before. So Florida requires voter ID um, to provide proof of identification. 36 out of the 50 states require some form of proof that you are who you say you are. Um, eight states require a photo ID. We are one of those eight states. Most states just require proof of who you are, whether that be a piece of mail, or, or an ID or whatever, your birth certificate, your marriage license, your passport, something that lines up that you're holding a, something that says, yes, it's me. Um, only eight states require a photo ID so they can 
say, okay, well, you look like your picture, um, which doesn't necessarily mean you are that person, right? Like it could still be, you know, like if you're Jane Doe and there's another Jane Doe, you know, you don't have a photo next to the voter registration list. So um, these laws reduce turnout for people who can't afford ID, who can't afford to always um, have their information current because every time you move, you've got to update your information and a lot of people can't afford that. Um, plus the, the fact that obtaining ID is very cumbersome because you have to go, you've got to camp out, got to basically move down to the office and, and set up a tent like what because they're always so busy and um, and you've got to have the money for it. The last time I looked, it was like thirty five dollars in the state of Florida for a driver's license and like 10 or 20 for a state issued ID. But for people who are very low on the income scale, that is still a substantial amount of money. So, um, so a lot of people push back on this requirement because people have found statistically that it's disproportionately disadvantages people who fall in the category of having a harder time to be able to get those items, especially if they don't have transportation to go down and get an ID. Um, if they, you know, if you work like day labor, you don't necessarily need an ID. Like if it's, you know, if it's a 1099 or, you know, there's a lot of people don't like don't have the means to go and get it and they don't they haven't had a need for an ID for very much or they've been able to get away with like the really old one that's expired that they haven't gotten updated because a lot of people are like well I can still tell it to you it's okay so I so, use my grandma's just so I don't have to change it every time I move yeah oh oh yeah your address and see yeah. technically that's illegal oh well but everybody does it if you've got a permanent permanent residence, right? So that's right. But if you so say you go to vote, right? So say your grandmother lives in Lynn Haven and you live in Panama City Beach and you vote in a Lynn Haven election, you're voting illegally for those city candidates because that is not your residence. It's not where you live. Oh, or I so that's because you live in Lynn Haven, your grandmother lives in Callaway. So you're voting in a Callaway election and you're not a resident of Callaway. I have there. <laughs> yes. Then I messed up. Well, so it all depends on the situation, right? It's not, it's not clear cut. It's so, it's very convoluted. So one issue, like say people who own property in two different places, a lot of people get frustrated because they can't vote, but in one spot. You can only vote where you claim homestead exemption if you own a home. Okay. And then the other place, oh, well, if you don't get a say in what they do with your taxes. <laughs> so but, boo on you for having enough money to have like two homes. <laughs> no, so, so some people, like military is a good example of this. So, you know, they move around a lot. Some people choose to change their party, affili their, not affiliation, their registration, wherever they move to. Some people just keep it at their permanent residence home and get like a vote by mail ballot. And that's fine too. Um, college students, okay, like my home of residence is in Tampa, but I'm in Tallahassee for school. You can either register to vote in Tallahassee because you're there and you're being more impacted by what's going on there, or you can keep your registration in Tampa because you're more familiar with what's going on back home. Both answers are correct. If you have intent to return, you see this is where it gets really gray. If you have an intent to return to that permanent residence, you can continue to use it as your permanent residence. Like if you, if you, well, I might move back into my grandma's place, like this might not be my permanent home, then it's, it's okay, but kind of not to like, and it's one of those things where it all depends on your intent. Like, and here, what we always told people at the elections office is where do you put your head down at night? That's the safest place to register. <laughs> like, where do you lay down at night? Because the homeless, for example, like when they would register to vote, a lot of them put the rescue mission because that's where they would stay at night. 
um, or the Winn-Dixie parking lot. They put like the Winn-Dixie address because that's where they slept at night. And so that gets very complicated very fast. So it's not not okay for you to be registered at your grandma's place if that's like your permanent place, if you've moved around a lot and you aren't planning on staying in one particular place. It gets really shady when you're like in two different states type thing and you register in one state, you forget that you're registered in another, you, get, you know, because then you could vote. Like it's the, the biggest problem is presidential elections, right? Like, you know, oh, you got a ballot from the state. And that doesn't happen often because most people aren't gonna take the time to do that. Most people won't take the time to vote once, let alone twice. But it's one of those things where you just have to, it's all about intent. So it's a very gray area. You had a question? Um, I, I just realized there are a couple things that I could have. So I plan to live with my parents um, when I'm continuing my college education. Sure. My parents are divorced and lived in two different parts of Panama City slash Panama City Beach. You would have to just choose one. Yeah. And that would be where you registered. Yeah. So, um, so, so that gets to be very convoluted very quickly. Um, state and county governments run their own elections. Like there's not federal, like, provisions or requirements or anything for that. Um, like they choose how they want to lay out everything and how they create their ballots. And that varies from county to county as well. Um, like you go and vote in another county after you've moved and it's not going to look like how the ballot was laid out in the old county that you lived in because it's at their discretion. Um, now the state can impose like a certain level of like uniformity on certain things. Um, so, and that of course depends on the state. So in 2000, uh, in the 2000 election with Gore and Bush, for example, um, we had that lovely punch card system and butterfly ballots that made us have to do that big recount and look at the system more closely because we had a lot of problems with like the punch not going all the way through, people accidentally punching like partially between to names and so you don't know what their intent was and so that's why we got rid of that process because it's a nightmare um the help america vote act of 2003 required states to use computerized voter registration databases um to make sure that like you've got like a, an electronic like backup where you've got the registration in the system some people have worried about cybersecurity concerns, but there's, I mean, there's backup after backup after backup and all kinds of security measures in place. Um, I mean, I worked for the elections office for five years and we never had one issue. Um, so, I, I mean, it's, it's a very secure process. It's definitely something that we, um, we spend quite a lot of time and effort and money to make sure that our process is protected. Um, so convenience voting, like early voting and voting by mail, removes the need to stand in a potentially long line to cast a vote and may result in increased voter turnout. So here you can see that she's dropping off her vote by mail ballot. So, you know, we talked about the vote by mail ballot like two weeks ago and like the need to make sure your signature is right and that kind of thing. Um, early voting is another option. Every state is different. Every county is different as to how many days are allotted. Um, city elections are where it usually gets tricky as far as consistency sake. So um, one city, so when it's a city election, the city has to pay the county supervisor elections to hold that election. So they may not have money to pay for early voting if it's a very small city. Like the last Springfield election, they didn't do early voting because it was a, it's a very small city and it's just a lot of money to pay those workers to you know have x amount of days for early voting so instead they promote like vote by mail or election day voting so it all depends on the city as to whether or not they want to pay extra funds for that and for how many days so um we've talked a little bit about presidential nominations before um but this goes into a lot more detail so Parties spend a ton of time finding candidates to run for office of all 
levels, but specifically for the presidential nominations. Um, they try very hard to find people to run that they that line up with the political party's values and platform and you know are who they want in charge basically so the process takes place through all the state primaries that we just talked about and caucuses where candidates win delegates to a national convention the process has increased uh increasingly become uh front loaded as states fight to be the first of the presidential preference primaries where they all like want to be in january or february or whatever so they are a larger influence in the presidential election because as the stuff progresses if you're like april several candidates have already dropped out of the race by then right so your people aren't getting as many options um by the time the race comes around to you so that's why a lot of states fight very hard to get first crack at presidential preference primaries um, then they also have their nominating conventions, which, you know, is always a big week long event that's all telecast and all that um, parties put together their party platform and what they want to focus on as a political party. Um, their philosophy, their principles, their policy positions, what they want to focus on for the next four years, all that's done at the convention. Um, and then the delegates at the electoral call that have been chosen during the presidential preference reiterate the vote from their state and all of that's added up and then they nominate their person to run for office and you think that's complicated then you get to the electoral college now the electoral college is no okay that's fine i can re share it so i've got here. Ooh. So um, I have it saved in the module. So I'm going to pull up the Electoral College video that helps explain the Electoral College. It is a much, much simpler way to explain the Electoral College than the way the book does it. Oh, pause, pause, stop. Pause. Okay, video, that's fine. Resume share. Okay. No. New share. Okay. So, um, is there a way to make this louder? Okay, hold on. Let me make sure I can get the volume up. I didn't just play our ears out. We'll see. Okay. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Joe. Today we're going to learn about something called the Electoral College. Yes, Joe. But it's not an actual college. It's part of our election process that was put in place by the framers of our Constitution at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Our forefathers didn't want to let Congress alone decide who should be president. But they were worried that if they left it up to the people to decide, most would vote for their role of candidate. Obviously, this gave an unfair advantage to the larger states. They wanted the smaller states to have a more equal voice, which meant they needed to come up with a better system. They found the solution to the ancient problem. Romans didn't want the rich to have too much power. So they divided their male citizens into groups of 100, according to left, and each group received only one vote. This system was called the Centurial Assembly. It was this ideal of fair representation that our founding fathers used to create the electoral college system in the United States, which gives each state a number of elected representatives, called electors, who formally select the president and vice president of the United States. The number of electors in each state equals the number of its congressional senators, which is always two, plus the number of its congressional representatives, which is different for each state and depends on its population. Over time, the Electoral College has evolved a bit. Though the method for choosing electors has changed several times, it is still basically the same. 
So here's what a lot of people don't really understand. Maybe not even your parents. When people next vote for president of the United States in what is sure to be an exciting 2008 election, it's a little dated. <laughs> voting for electors who have pledged to vote for a particular set of candidates. Ballots in some states make it clear that voters are actually voting for electors who cast the official votes for president and vice president. Article 2 of the Constitution says that each state shall appoint electors in a manner determined by the state legislature. That means that it's up to each state's legislature to decide how electors are selected. In some states, electors are selected by registered voters in an election that occurs several months before the presidential election. In other states, electors are selected by elected officials in the state's political party, such as the state party's executive committee. Typically, electors are individuals who are loyal to their political party and pledge to vote for their party's nominees, president and vice president. Here's the catch. Sometimes the electoral vote produces a different outcome than the nationwide popular vote. Wait. In fact, this has happened a few times in our history, but never was it more dramatic than during the 2000 election, which was the closest presidential election in U.S. history. That's the one. Now, we all know who won that election. Almost. It was George W. Bush who ultimately became president, but it was one bumpy roller coaster of a ride. As the vote wound down, both candidates had close to the number of electoral votes needed to win. It was neck and neck, and it all came down to one final state. Florida, things weren't looking so good for one of the candidates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, watch that. Watch. <laughs> Although newscasters first named Gore the winner, a few hours later, they did a turnaround, declaring Bush the winner. Gore even called to congratulate Mr. Bush. An hour later, he took it back. This was getting better than any movie you could imagine. Anyway, here's how it all played out. Once Florida's count was made, each candidate hit 49% of the popular vote. Out of more than 6 million Florida votes, Bush was ahead by fewer than 2,000 votes. With the vote that close, according to Florida law, a recount was necessary. The election outcome was delayed for over a month. As the entire country waited anxiously. Finally, after several recounts and lawsuits, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that recounting ballots was unconstitutional and said Florida could certify its vote. They did. And in January 6, 2001, Congress met to certify the electoral vote. And so, with 271 electoral votes to the Court's 266, George W. Bush narrowly became the 43rd president of the United States. Gore won the nationwide popular vote by more than 500,000. But Mr. Bush had more electoral votes, and that made the difference. You might wonder how it's possible for one candidate to win the nationwide popular vote, but not win enough electoral votes to be elected president. Well, it's possible because all but two states have a winner take all system, which means that the candidate who receives the most popular votes in the state receives all of that state's electoral votes. Even if the difference in statewide popular votes was very small. That's what happened in 2000. Bush narrowly won the popular vote in Florida, and in so doing, he won all of Florida's 25 electoral votes, which gave him enough electoral votes to win the election. The end. Some story, huh? Man, it was exciting. And it really put a spotlight on the Electoral College. Since the beginning, the Electoral College has had its fans and its detractors. Okay, now you're just messing with me, right? Anyway, during its long history, many have tried to eliminate the Electoral College from our political system, but to no avail. The main reason is because no one has come up with anything better. That said, there are compelling arguments both for and against the Electoral College. One of the arguments for the Electoral College is that by requiring the distribution of popular support, it makes sure that states with large populations don't have an unfair advantage. In other words, no one region of the United States provides enough electoral votes needed to win the presidency, so a candidate has to gather support from a broad range of states. Also, people for the Electoral College argue that it maintains the federal system of representation we laid out in our Constitution. The House of Representatives was designed to represent the states according to the size of their population. The Senate was designed to represent each state and community regardless of its population. And the Electoral College was designed to represent each state's choice for the presidency. In contrast, those against the Electoral College argue that the winner-take-all nature of the system 
makes it difficult for third party or independent candidates to win enough electoral votes to become president. Needless to say, this ongoing debate will go on for a long time, but there's no denying that just the mere fact that the Electoral College is still around more than 200 years after it was established is a tribute to the genius of our founding fathers. Well, as you've seen, the Electoral College is a complex yet intricate part of our election process. The more you learn about it and the more you get involved, the better prepared you'll be when it's your turn to vote. Hope you had fun and remind your parents to vote. What? Stop. Ah, here we go. Okay. All right. So, um, so I know that that's a little like kiddish, you know, but I find that it's really helpful. Um, where's the? Oh, I lost the thing. Sorry, guys. Just a second to figure out where the thing go. Share screen. There we go. Okay. Okay, so, um, so hopefully that is like a really simplified way to understand the Electoral College. I find it's a lot cleaner way to explain it than the way that the book tries to break it down. Um, so hopefully that helps some for you guys. So let's, let's see we pass that. Um, so figure 9.3 also walks you through it if you need like a visual. Um, so that's in your book if you need help for that. So um, of course, campaigns in general are a complicated process and there's a lot of um, moving parts for it to be successful. So one key thing is whether or not an incumbent is in the race though, because an incumbent has a lot of advantages over someone who hasn't already held that seat. So an incumbent is the person who currently holds that particular position. So one, they're already established in that seat. Two, they're likely to have a larger donor base because they're already established, they've already been elected. Um, three, they're gonna have more connections from other um, elected officials to, um, to back them, to support them. Um, and so all of those things help where, um, oh, and name recognition. Name recognition is a big deal. They're gonna have net more name recognition than someone who either hasn't run for office or hasn't won. You know, Sometimes people have held another position, so then they have a lot of name recognition as well. So campaigns um, need somebody who can manage the process. They need a professional campaign manager who keeps everything on track for success um, and a formal organization with hundreds to thousands of volunteers, depending on the level of the position and professional campaign consultants. So that's, so you have your field campaign, which is your people who make the phone calls, register voters, knock on doors. You've got your communication side, the people who help um, do advanced work where they get you set up when you're going to a new community to speak and they get all of that lined up and get people to show up. Your press secretary, your communications director, your speech writers. Um, you've got people of all levels on a large campaign when you're talking about a presidential race. Now a local race, it's gonna be like one or two people doing like all of that. Um, but for a presidential race, like each position gets fleshed out or fleshed out as they get further along in the process and have more campaign money to do so. Sorry. So one of the things that have to be done in addition to the staffing 
is money, right? You can't do anything without money. So here's the breakdown for individual donations for um, from individual people. So $2,800 per candidate per election. So election is primary election, general election. So you can cut a check for 2,800 for the primary and then 2,800 for the general. Um, you can give $5,000 to a PAC per calendar year. So a PAC is a private group that raises and distributes funds for use in election campaigns. Um, so you can cut a check to, to a PAC that you support for them to use as they need once a year. Um, you can give up to $35,500 to a political party once a year, um, like at the national level, and then $10,000 to local political party committees once a year. Now, I don't know that any of us in this room have enough money to do any of that, but that is the max for the people who have a crud ton of money. <laughs> um, there's no limit to the number of people or PACs that an individual can give to though. So you can give $2,800 to this candidate, $2,800 to this candidate, $2,800 to that. This PAC, this PAC, and this PAC can each get five grand a pop. So if you've got a ton of money and you want to have a ton of influence, then you can just keep cutting checks across the board. So um, PACs are usually established by corporations, labor unions, interest groups, advocacy groups, people who want to influence the elections process, who want to influence politicians, who want to um, basically have their foot in the door to influence change in the process. Uh, nearly two thirds of all PACs represent corporations, trade associations, businesses, um, so you're, now the book used to have examples of PACs, but I don't see that it does, but that's okay. Um, you can just look up like PACs and you'll see, uh, different types. So, um, there used to be something that was a larger deal called soft money. Um, before we had, um, campaign finance reform in 2002, most donations were soft money which is unregulated contributions to the national party to be able to use as they saw fit. So after 2002, a political party can still have unlimited independent expenditures for candidates or defeating of like opposing candidates, but they cannot coordinate with the actual candidates campaign. So like the political party can go and put out this effort to try and get somebody elected but they can't coordinate with the efforts of that candidate's campaign because it's like it it would effectively like double that candidate's budget so that's no longer allowed um then there are 527 committees which are super PACs which is a nonprofit independent political action committee that may raise unlimited sums of money for corporations unions and individuals but is not permitted to contribute to or coordinate directly with parties or candidates so, um, and they can raise serious, serious money. Um, Stephen Colbert actually created his own super PAC back in, I think it was 2012 or 16 or something and raised a ton of money. Um, and the name of the super PAC was like a better, a better future for tomorrow, tomorrow or something like ridiculous, you know, vague nonsense. Um, and people actually gave to it and he ended up donating it to like some charity, but um, basically to show that like you can just raise money for any kind of nonsense and get away with it. Um, and then there's things called 5014 committees, which are politically active nonprofits. Under federal law, these nonprofits can spend unlimited amounts on political campaigns and not disclose their donors as long as their activities are not coordinated with the candidate campaigns and political activities are not their primary purpose. So it's kind of shady, right? Because then you don't know where that money's coming from. So you don't really know who's pulling the strings behind things. Um, so candidates can spend their own money in unlimited amounts. They can refinance their house. They can drop whatever they want. Yes. They're what? Yeah, they're only limited in not being able to coordinate with other people, but they're not limited in how much money they can raise. 
So um, individual donors are limited in how much they can give, but none of the packs are. So like the 527, the 501, the pack, none of that is limited. Um, so candidates can put themselves into the hole if they want, and a lot of candidates do. I know a candidate who ran for city mayor for Panama City, and he remortgaged his house, and he lost. And I'm like, I don't think I'd ever have that much faith in myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't raise it from other people. I'm not putting on my house. Um, I mean, he's an attorney, so they've got the money for it, but <laughs> still. <laughs> Um, so in 1976, the case of Buckley v. Valio introduced the concept that money is considered to be speech. Remember, we discussed that when we were talking about the amendments. It allows unlimited spending by candidates on their own campaigns because it's a way to facilitate the speech that they are trying to present in their campaign. So that's why they're um, why it's unlimited for like the PACs, because then you can just give, 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 give. Um, but then as a specific individual, they cut it off um, for some semblance of being fair. So we have two different types of campaigns. One is a grassroots campaign. This is largely volunteer based. This is like person to person contact. Um, and that is where you're talking, the knocking on the doors, the voter registration, the phone banks, that kind of thing. Um, Obama did that sort of campaign both times because he was a community organizer before, so he was very familiar with that process, and he took that effort in, onto the trail for his campaign. Um, Mitt Romney's campaign was largely media-based because he didn't have as many volunteers, so he directed his by um, mass media. So that's a lot of advertising, that's paying a lot of money for TV spots, radio spots, a lot of money for shirts and hats and yard signs and uh, bumper stickers and that kind of thing. Um, it can often involve negative or attack advertising. Everybody says they hate negative campaigns, but then people tend to see candidates who don't go negative at some point as weak. So like John Kerry refused to go negative in the 2004 race and the Bush administration did and people felt that Kerry was weak for not defending himself and it showed in the numbers and it's one of the reasons why Bush won. So unfortunately like attack ads happen at some point, you can say you're gonna run a clean campaign, but it almost never ends that way. It starts out that way, but it ends ugly. Um, a growing number or percentage of campaign ads are sponsored by political parties or advocacy groups, not specifically the candidate. Um, digital media and social media definitely help a lot with campaign advertising, which we've discussed before. So um, it's all about like which way you want to go. Grassroots effort is a lot of labor intensive work. It needs a lot of boots on the ground, but it's very effective. If you don't have as much of that, then you need to pour your money into a um, wide media blitz. So um, there's something called micro-targeting, which gets campaigns to be able to hone their messages to where they can target um, people very specifically. Like, okay, this demographic of people that we're trying to get to vote, they watch this sort of television, they focus on this, they're home during this time. So I'm gonna put ads specifically for that group, like younger people or, or moms or, or whatever, right? Um, and so they just hone in different ways to be able to target somebody. Like one of the examples that your book gives is the rural cowboy dad, that's very specific. But if that's a popular demographic based on where you're um, campaigning at, then like you hone ads specifically to them. Um, a lot of what parties and campaigns do is based around mobilizing, getting people out to vote, getting people to the polls, getting people to actually follow through and vote. So that's what a lot of campaigns spend time doing. People are more likely to turn out to vote if someone asks them face to face. Direct mail and impersonal phone calls are less likely to have an effect. That's why door to door canvassing is so important, yet dangerous. Um, because some people are crazy about people coming up to their door, right? Um, so, but it's a highly targeted effort. It's either like people who are likely to vote for your candidate 
people have already said they were supportive, but now we're a week out from the election and they still, they haven't voted. They got a vote by mail ballot. They haven't sent it in. They said they were going to early vote. They haven't early voted yet. We're a couple days out and we're now we're knocking on doors. Hey, do you need a ride to the polls? What can we do to help make sure you vote? Do you need me to take and drop off your vote by mail ballot? What can we do to help make this process easier? And so that is a huge part of what political parties focus on what campaigns focus on, especially in the end, it's just all boots on the ground, trying to get every single vote squeezed out of the population that's possible. So um, there are three different ways that people decide on how they're gonna vote. And we've talked about some of this before. Um, so party loyalty, right? Like people are very partial to their political party a lot of times, not always, but a lot of the time. So it's more likely to assert itself in less visible races. So um, so on like a local level, like we talked about before, you're more likely to vote the person if you are familiar with them, right? Like, oh, I might not vote for, you know, maybe a Republican normally, but I know Jimmy Paternus, I know his family, so I'm more likely to vote for him. Um, but you're more likely to vote your party line in a larger race maybe where you're not as connected to them and you don't know them on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. Um, and of course, your partisan loyalty varies on other factors too. There are some things that end up kind of trumping that for certain people, you know, like if their party isn't as important as like their religion, then that may be a larger factor. But generally speaking, partisan loyalty is the first factor that people look at and how they're going to vote. Second is issues and policy preferences. Now you would think that would be the first one, but people will default to their party when they're not familiar or have not taken the time to become familiar enough with the candidates. So some voters cast their ballot for candidates whose positions on important issues they believe to be closest to their own. Uh, the state of the economy is often a dominant issue. Like when you start hitting people's pocketbooks, they are paying attention, right? So, um, so that matters a lot. People are going to vote for people that line up with their values and their policy stances. Um, and then the candidate itself. Now used to, like before FDR, it was mostly candidate characteristics. Like who did you like more or less? Because people ran on very similar platforms. There wasn't a large difference at the time. And then when Hoover and FDR were running, it was a stark contrast, very, very different individuals. And that's the first time that you really saw that kind of divide in candidates. So that's when some of these other things started to come into play. Um, but the candidates race, ethnicity, religion, gender, geographic background and social background may be factors. A lot of people like to think, oh, I'm about that. I vote the person, I don't vote the whatever, but that's crap because everybody has like even subconscious biases that they don't realize, right? Like, um, like a woman may be more likely to vote for another woman because we got to support our women or the opposite. If they're raised very conservative, oh, I don't think a woman can handle that. Like I've heard women be like, prejudice against women, it's ridiculous, or sexist against whatever you want to say, um, you know, or, you know, I'm going to vote for the African-American candidate because I'm African-American, like that, like, because you can see yourself in the candidate, and a lot of people don't realize that, but people look for that in candidates, they need somebody that they can connect to, and we'll talk about that in more detail when we talk about the presidency chapter next week. So um, the 2020 election, which is pretty fresh on everybody's minds. Um, so former President Biden won the popular vote and the Electoral College. Um, Senator Kamala Harris was his running mate. Everybody knows that. Uh, Democrats retained control of the House of Representatives. Um, the control of the Senate has been very like precarious. It's like right on the border sometimes. Um, there were two runoff elections in Georgia because the race was so tight that they had to do a runoff. There wasn't like a clear winner. Um, Republicans needed at least one seat to maintain their majority. Um, so this was actually done like before the end of the election because it's saying they will. Um, so, but they didn't, they weren't able to maintain that. Um, if they had, like there would have been a big issue with like the redistricting lines being redrawn to try and help them maintain that majority. When we did that after the census, 
Um, as we know, the 2020 election was a dumpster fire <laughs> in a lot of ways. It was very hectic and stressful, I think, for a lot of people to watch. Um, and there were times where you're like, okay, we got to two old men going toe to toe. Somebody's going to break a hip. I, we need it, right? Take a breath, step back, <laughs> calm down. Let's breathe and act like grownups, right? Um, easier said than done, I think, for a lot of candidates. Um, so that ended up shifting the dynamic for power and that kind of thing. Um, we've talked about this before. Polarization has become a bigger issue since um, FDR and the Great Depression. We have seen less and less like middle ground for political parties, more and more like hardcore left, hardcore right, no middle ground. And then people just don't know which way to go because a lot of people are somewhere in the middle. Maybe they're socially liberal, but they're fiscally conservative. And you don't see a lot of that being represented anymore in the parties. And so a lot of people get frustrated because they don't see themselves reflected in the parties as much um, as they would have liked. So it just becomes a huge mess. Um, another thing that increased polarization was the impeachment process for President Trump, um, because the people who were supportive of Trump felt isolated, they felt um, not heard. Um, the people who were not supporters of Trump felt vindicated in that process, but not in the fact that um, the Senate didn't continue, it, you know, it ended at the House of Representatives. So that was just like another fork in the road for a lot of people. Um, so tensions have definitely been high for uh, politics since that process, as we know. The coronavirus definitely impacted a lot of things. Um, the racial strife and mass protests that we've had across the country, those are definitely items that we've talked about back and forth that have caused a lot of um, polarization and a lot of, honestly, this isn't how the book would word it, but like hurt, I think, like in society that a lot of people just feel very divided. Um, so, um, let's see, we don't, we've talked about some of this. You guys also just recently lived through it. So I don't think we have to delve into a whole lot of this. Um, a, more than 20 candidates went up for the nomination with the Democrats, it's a lot. And that's not uncommon though. Like when Trump ran, it was like 16 Republicans or something at the beginning of 16. So um, of course the same old issues started out the divide, but then it very, very quickly became about the coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter movement and all the protests we were seeing. And that's sort of what the campaign ended up focusing around. Um, we know all about the pandemic. Um, and all of that, I mean, we saw all of that. Um, the murder of George Floyd ended up being a, a big catalyst for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and then we had more death after that, that continued that justifiable anger that we were seeing in society um, for people being targeted. Um, so, so that was um, a lot of things that added fuel to the fire. So the results, we had almost 160 million people vote, which is crazy. 66% of the people who were registered and eligible to vote actually voted. Highest turnout since 1900. I mean, that's crazy to me to think that it's been that long and that we just lived through that um, in 120 years. I, it's crazy. Uh, vote by mail and early voting were popular because people were not trying to catch the plague and die, right? So uh, Democrats were more likely to vote by mail. And that was because the Democratic Party pushed that. Like, listen, don't go out, don't get coughed on, don't, like do vote by mail or go early when the polls are not busy to the early voting or whatever. Um, and then Republicans pushed in person like day of election. And so that's when you saw them show up. You saw the Democrats vote early with the um, early voting and the vote by mail, and then you saw the Republicans vote day of. So, um, and that's, I mean, that's exactly what happened based on what the parties pushed and people listened. So um, we had the swing states kind of be the deciders, which happens a lot. So Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. Um, this shows you the breakdown that's on page 283. 
So not surprising, right? Like the more conservative states voted Republican, the more liberal states voted Democrat, right? I mean, like no surprise, not really. Um, so Democrats kept the house, but Republicans still got a dozen seats. Um, some house Democrats um, lost seats, uh, Republicans kept the Senate. So that's made for a very like split, um, DC basically, where it's been hard to get a whole lot done, a lot of arguing. Um, we know about the recounts and the um, the uh, the lawsuits and that sort of thing. Um, and we know about the rally that um, happened in DC. You know, things got very ugly because people don't know how to be grown ups. So um, in every election, election workers in each state and county meticulously process and count mail-in ballots. Some states are permitted to begin counting before election day. Florida is one of them. We can do it up to five days before the election. Um, it's all very like above board. There's like a committee that meets of like county officials and stuff to like watch the process, make sure everything's done like it should be. Um, some have to wait until the polls close on election day. So that that so that confuses people when they're seeing national results come in because then they're seeing numbers come in quicker from some states than the other and they don't understand why and they think something shady is happening. But it's the nature of the fact that each state gets to decide how their process runs. So that's the downside to not having like a national process. Um, in 2020, due to the high volume of mail-in ballots, election workers counted mail-in ballots for days after the election. So, and that's um, one of the things that you see too, as the tallies start coming in um, differently, it depends on when, um, when the state allows for the numbers to start being tallied as to when you start seeing results. So two big things um, played a role in the 2020 election. Uh, moderates and independents ended up supporting Biden um, who were unsatisfied with the, the four years of the Trump administration um, and 65% of first time voters ended up supporting Biden. They targeted a lot of first time voters, got people registered to vote into the polls. Um, COVID also had a really big role. People were um, worried. You know, we had a big problem with our economy. People were losing jobs. People were losing, um, they were concerned about losing their home because they didn't have enough money coming in there. It was a lot of stuff like that. Lower income people obviously hit the hardest because they're the first ones to feel it when they don't have money coming in. 75% um, of small businesses had a large impact. Um, so the economy ended up being a huge issue. When the economy starts doing poorly, the president who is in charge at the time is always the one who's blamed. Whether they're 100% to blame or not, doesn't matter the way the community views it is the buck stops with the president and the president should have done whatever the community xyz and so that always negatively impacts the incumbent if the economy is not doing well at the time of their election yes so biden don't have any control over how up or down the guy read something where he's going to try it i said that at the beginning of class he's releasing um fuel reserves to help lower the price but because we have a free market it it's up to the market like we don't we don't control all of the pricing so like regardless biden trump it doesn't matter like they they don't control how the economy and the free market play out as to the cost of supply and demand so he's just trying to react to it by lowering the cost by releasing some of the reserve It's going up. Well, it's not been going or down. Do yeah, he's releasing reserve. That's what he's doing about it to lower the price. Because we don't have enough supply out there right now. So supply and demand, right? Like if you need more than you have, the price goes up because it's valued at more. If there's more fuel in the market, then there's not as large of a demand for it. So it can be cheaper. 
Like the more you have of something, the cheaper it can be. You don't have as much of it, it starts costing more money. So that's why he's releasing some of the reserve into it because then it'll help drop the prices a little bit. But it's a short-term solution. Simple fact of the matter is, is we're running out of fossil fuel to like suck up out of the ground. So Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because because they're refusing to drill. They're not increasing their drilling production to get more oil. So that's part of the reason why the prices are going up. And he's pushing them on why. Like, why are you not? not getting more produced. My question is, is it the pipeline? Say what? Is it the pipeline? Which pipeline? The, the, one that they, the one that Trump started, I guess. That, that I'm not sure about. But the pipeline was considered to be dangerous by the environmentalists as well. Like, you know, every time we have an oil spill, every time we have a problem, like we're talking about millions of dollars worth of repair. So the real issue isn't even like our short-term problem, it's the long-term problem of still being dependent on fossil fuels that are a finite resource. It's not an unlimited resource that we have. At some point we run out of the dinosaurs that are in the ground and then we have nothing. We have no backup plan. None of our cars are, are set for that, right? Like the average person does not own a hybrid or doesn't own an electric car or a solar powered vehicle. All of our stuff is dependent on oil, which is all a finite resource. We do not have unlimited oil. And so once we drill it all, then what? And so you have to also think about, okay, short-term problem, we need gas. So go drill, baby drill, okay. But now you're affecting the environment and the long-term plan of, we have to be able to survive on this planet. And if we ruin it by rushing for a short-term solution, we're still not solving our long-term problem. So that is the economy versus like the environmental aspects. And there's always conflict there because people always think the short term for money and they're not thinking necessarily the long term because at some point we will run out. And so anybody who is working in an oil rig is out of a job. Anybody who works for a gas company is out of a job. And so there's been a lot of talk in the government and in other countries about how do we start transitioning away from that before we have to because when we have to it's too late like we all need to be ready before that happens before we run out so a lot of the countries have been talking about okay how do we how do we retrain people for other jobs how do we convert these people to other industries how do we start making the transition to electric or to solar or to wind or to whatever you know whatever resource is and as infinite as long as the planet exists. So that is a big problem too. So um, so it's, it's just a colossal mess because we keep going back down the same path and it's always a short term fix, but it, it, that's not going to last forever. So, um, so this lays out who tends to participate in political campaigns and elections. So the more educated you are, the more likely you are to do all these things, contributing to money to a campaign, attending a political rally, working or volunteering on a campaign. Um, and then your age, that is kind of dependent on which category we're talking about. So um, 65 and up is more likely to contribute money than they are to volunteer, right? Um, but 18 to 29 is more likely to attend an event. And then um, older people are the most likely to work or volunteer on a campaign because they've got the time to. So it all kind of depends on what category you're looking at, but this kind of breaks that down for you. Uh, show specifics. 
So uh, this says Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won the 2020 presidential election over Donald Trump and Mike Pence with 306 electoral votes, 232. While their win was decisive and historic, the future of the United States remained uncertain due to the coronavirus pandemic, economic insecurity, and a highly polarized population, which is very true. Um, so, and unfortunately it was like that before, like that's not a result of 2020, it's been like that for a hot minute. Um, so public opinion poll, do you think voters make decisions based on the influence of campaign ads? Yes, uh, campaign ads influence voters. No, people already know who they prefer before seeing the ads. B, you think B, you think a lot of people have that information before? Yeah, 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 there, uh, I agree. I think the ads are good for undecideds um, and for people who may not be paying attention to the fact that there's an election going on, but the people who are really engaged in the process know pretty early before they even start seeing political ads. Should there be limits on the amount of money candidates can spend on their own elections? Yeah. I think so, Wait, yeah. Their own money? Yeah, their own money. No, no. no. So currently there is no limit on what you, the candidate, can spend on your own campaign because it's considered to be a form of speech. But this is asking if you think that should be the case or do you think that should be limited? No, not limited, not limited. I, 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 think some feel like I guess it depends on the candidate how much money they have, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you got how many billions of dollars in the bank? Maybe, maybe you should back off. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we get rid of the electoral college or change the way that it operates? Um, that is such a complicated question. A lot of people say yes, because it was designed to, because at the time less people were informed and educated about the issues, they didn't have as much access to the information at hand. And so it was sort of a checks and balance system to make sure that the public didn't make like a horrid mistake in their voting. Um, but then some people say that if we only had popular vote, small states would always lose out. Now we don't have to worry about that because we're Florida, but New Jersey has to worry about that and Rhode Island has to worry about that. And this, and like North Dakota, because they've got like 10 people, you know, <laughs> like those people, those states would never have a say because they wouldn't matter. If we did by popular vote, the only states who would matter would be New York, Florida, Texas, and California, because all a candidate would have to do would be to dominate those states and campaign the hell out of those states, right? So, and then they could ignore everybody else. So then the whole nation isn't truly represented. So a lot, and a lot of people don't think about it in terms like that. Um, so I don't know if it would be helpful to make like an incremental, like maybe some tweaks would be helpful more than um, like a complete overhaul. I'm trying to find the section where it talks about Nebraska and Maine. Does anybody remember where that was? Let me see if I can find it. Nebraska and Maine. I actually don't see it listed in the electoral college. I mean, I know it's in here, but I can't remember where they list it. A lot of people aren't completely opposed to the electoral college. They just would like to see some updates, but nobody's been able to come up with like a better system as of yet either. So, you know, who knows? Like, I mean, the popular vote doesn't work on its own, but then the electoral college frustrates people too. And a lot of that I think is because it's not, it's such a complicated system that it's not explained in a manner in which people understand it. And so that makes it hard to, so. Um, several democratic countries have compulsory voting like Australia where all citizens have to vote and they find people who don't. So with Australia, you absolutely have to vote and they have like a 90 something percent like turnout as a result. Um, should the US adopt a policy to increase voter participation or no? No, no. no. people are like, I ain't trying to lose more money. <laughs> 
Um, I, yeah, I think most people feel like it should still be their choice because even if somebody's forced, does that mean that they're going to like make a good choice or do any homework or they're just going to go and like Christmas tree it, you know? I'd rather the people who want to participate, participate than like gun to their head and they have to, you know? So um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think laws, policies, and the way government operates in general would be different if everyone who is eligible to vote actually did so? You don't think it would, you don't think if more people put their voice out there, it would change anything? I, I think it would. I think if more people showed up to the polls and voted and participated, they would have to listen. Like they can screw over the groups of people who don't show up to vote. But if they show up to vote, then they have to listen to them and they can't, you know, make decisions that like negatively impact young college students and that sort of thing. So yeah, it, um, it would definitely show it would, a different side. Um, so this gives you a breakdown and it's in your earlier on in your chapter, Let me find it here. So on page 257, you see the voter turnout in comparison by state. I mean, sorry, by country. So the most recent numbers actually for Australia, it was 90%, now it's 81% and they're compulsory. 78% for Brazil, 71 for Germany, 65 for India, 61 for South Africa, 60 for Japan, UK, 60, and you keep going down and down and down. So um, our general turnout is 45%. Now this last election, it was 66%, which was a lot better. But on average, we have roughly half of the people, maybe a little bit less vote. Um, this is a really interesting portion of the book for you guys to check out on registering to vote. Um, on pages 264 and 265. So and it walks you through like what you need to do. How do you know? Um, how do I know how to register? So you can always go to vote411.com and they can walk you through it like you're not sure of like where what the voter form is in your particular state like it'll direct you to that uh the league of women voters is the one who runs that and they're a nonpartisan group and their goal is to just make sure people are informed and are turning out and voting um what sort of information you need depending on the state you're in what address you should use like we just talked about um are you required to vote with a political party the answer is no it's not required um, it does lessen what you can vote on in a party if you don't in, in a primary if you don't choose a party. Uh, where can you vote? What's on the ballot? What will happen at the polling place? What happens if you have a problem voting? So this little insert is really helpful for that. Um, and I am going to bring the voter registration forms for you guys next week. I, I just completely forgot to make the copies. Um, but we have gone over the voter registration form before. Um, so you guys are familiar with that process. So that is, I forget how long this chapter is. Chapter nine used to be like three separate chapters. They had one on like political parties and one on participating and one on like, like the campaigns and elections. And then they just put it into one super long chapter. <laughs> is it, is chapter 10? Well, chapter 10 has always been a big one because there's a lot about Congress um so yeah it's a lot back to back okay so that takes care of that one so what we're gonna what i want to do is let me pull this up real quick because we have already talked about congress a lot so i want to skim through real quick I mean, we've talked about Congress quite a bit, so I want to go through just whatever is left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so I'm going to tear through this really quick. If anybody happens to like, I mean, I know I've already made this feel, but if you need to go to the bathroom, just go to the bathroom, right? So, um, so you guys know that Congress is made up of the Senate and the House of Representatives. So we have 100 senators, two from each state. House of Representatives varies based on population. Currently, we have 435 House of Representatives members um, total. And um, 
you know, and that depends. Yeah, it hasn't changed in a while because it's it hasn't so much shifted in large numbers as people just like move from state to state and that'll like kind of shift around numbers some. Um, so, so we're already familiar with that, which is good. So Congress is responsive to their uh, constituents. You guys already know that. We've been talking about that all semester. Um, we know that it's a two chamber co um, Congress legislator. You guys know that. Senators focus on the entire state. So they have a larger, more diverse group of constituents to focus on. House of Representatives is much more targeted. They can concentrate on a much smaller area, like Northwest Florida is very different than like South Florida. Um, and so they they have like a totally different demographic and what they need to do to get reelected. So um, as you know, the house is two year terms. You have to be at least 25, so you can be a little younger um, for House of Representatives. Um, it's elected by the people of the district. Senate, we know is six year terms. Um, you have to be at least 30 for that and then at least 35 for president. So they kind of stepped it up. 100 members, two per state, originally elected by the state officials, but now it's elected by us. Um, and so that changed a while back. Um, so let's see, we talked about, we talked about this. Yes, House members focus on local interests. Senators focus on like statewide and national issues. Um, they're a little more insulated because they don't have to run for office right away. So like that they screw up in like year one or two of that six years, people aren't going to remember it by the time re-election happens. House of Representatives screws up. They're running for election like the next day, right? So they have eyes on them much more. So they have to be a lot more careful in what they do um, than senators. And they're much more targeted in who they focus with. So um so representatives are either either treat themselves as a delegate or a trustee and really it's kind of a little bit of both so a delegate is a representative who votes according to the preferences of his or her constituency so what people want back home they just repeat that in dc a uh, trustee is a representative who votes based on what he or she thinks is best for the constituency because they're going to have more information that might not be privy to the public like security matters and that kind of thing and so they take that sort of stuff into account so honestly it's a little bit of both depending on the situation like they try to honor what their constituents want but they also have information that we're not aware of and so we have to put a certain level of trust in them to make those decisions based on everything they know that's going on back home that's best for us but uh, is also best for everybody. So it's a tricky balancing act. So to more effectively promote a legislative agenda addressing issues that disproportionately affect racial and ethnic minority groups, members of Congress from those groups have formed caucuses. Here, Representative Chuy Garcia speaks with fellow members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus in support of DACA, which is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So basically people who were born here in the States with their parents were not. So, um, so these are two different types of representation that we also see. We have descriptive and sub <laughs> substantive representation. So descriptive is a type of representation in which representatives have the same racial, gender, ethnic, religious, or educational backgrounds as their constituents. It's based on the principle that if two individuals are similar, then one generally represents the other's interests. So kind of a mirror image, right? Like how I'd mentioned before, people tend to vote for people that they can kind of see themselves in, that they can connect with. And then the other type of representation is in which a representative is held accountable to a constituency if he or she fails to represent the constituency properly. This is incentive for the representative to provide good representation when his or her personal background, views, and interests differ from those of his or her constituency. So, you know, um, we have started to see more minorities and women elected into Congress in recent years, which has been great in the last two decades. Um, 
these groups really did not have any representation in Congress before that, but we've been making large strides to correct that. Um, we still don't have as much representation as would make sense. So in theory, Congress is a reflection of our population. So if 50% of the population are female, then in theory, 50% of Congress should be female. If you know, 32% are African American, then 32% of Congress should be African American in theory. But that's not necessarily an application because these people weren't even able to run for office or register to vote for so long. So there's that incumbent factor of the older white folks who have been in those positions continuing to get reelected and it's harder to make headway. Um, the legal profession is the dominant career for most members of Congress before their election, in other words, attorneys, uh, and members of Congress are more educated overall than most Americans. You're not going to oftentimes see like somebody with only a high school diploma elected to Congress. It's going to be someone with like a master's degree or a doctorate or um, a law degree. So this shows you the increase in diversity in Congress that we've seen in the last um, 30 years, which is fantastic, steady as we go. Um, so that has continued. So, um, so one of the things that people look for is for folks who are elected to really represent them back home and to be voices for that. Um, so the idea of a representative being an agent for the constituents back home is the sort of like client attorney privilege situation. Representatives are supposed to find out what their constituents care about and then take those interests into account when they're governing, when they're joining committees, when they're making voting uh, decisions. For example, a lot of times our House of Representative member here oftentimes tries to get on like the veterans committee or the military members, whatever, because we have the military bases here. So that influences a lot of what happens in this area. And so you'll see our representatives take a larger vested interest in that because they're trying to represent the people back home. Um, so it's done through continual communication of the constituents, email, social media, that kind of thing. They spend a lot of time in staffing on casework issues, you know, when constituents contact their office and say, hey, I have this problem, and then trying to get that problem solved for them. So that makes a big difference. Three major factors decide who tends to get elected, who runs for Congress. Parties cannot control who gets nominated, but they can encourage people that they think would be good to run. Uh, the incumbency advantage, like we talked about before, and redistricting, like who the strong people are in that um, district. And if the lines change and somebody's no longer in that district, then they've got to go back to the drawing board. Um, so we've already talked about the incumbency factor being well-liked, well-known, having name recognition, being able to get more done for their people back home because they're already established. They can already kind of scratch the backs of people. Um, this shows you who elects Congress. So 2018 voters for the population. So 51% of women, 49% are men. This is as of 2018 for our population. Um, and then this is the people, the, how it's broken up. Um, so the, see the big number is the population. The little number is the actual electorate. So that's fairly even. Um, age, 22% of people are 18 to 29, 25% 30 to 44, 34% 45, 64, et cetera. And then you can see how it breaks down. It's not quite accurate, but it's, it's kind of close. So we're seeing a better reflection of um, how it's lining up. We're, we're getting there. Um, and this is by race. And so the numbers are a little off, but close. Um, and then income, the income is very different under 30,000 for the population um, versus the electorate, you know, obviously a very big difference since most attorneys are the ones in um, and they, you know, you're gonna have less attorneys in the population, but they're more likely to run for our, to be in office. So you'll see an opposite here that the others don't match with. 
Um, so you're more likely to get reelected if you're an incumbent, as long as you haven't made your entire constituency angry at you. Um, you have an increased likelihood of reelection. Um, so we talked about redistricting before, right? In one of the other chapters to some extent. Um, so every 10 years we have redistricting done that matches the census. So um, apportionment is the process that happens every 10 years to allocate where the congressional seats get moved to based on population. So for example, in 2020, like we gained two seats in Florida. We had 27 before, we'll have 29 House of Representatives members now. Most of the things um, didn't change, but you see like several people lost one. Texas gained three, because a lot of people are moving to Texas lately, a lot of jobs in Texas. Um, so every 10 years that's done to try and keep up with the current demographic of population and who lives where so people are being represented properly so the redistricting happens after that's all done um and there's a very tight watch to make sure that gerrymandering doesn't happen where lines are drawn to give advantage to one political party or one race or you know that kind of thing where it's just done on population um so the little insert in your book talks about contacting your Congress member. Um, and so this is a really great breakdown if you're ever interested and you're not sure what steps to take. So the Supreme Court has definitely heard several cases about redistricting. 2019, they found that it was something that um, was a political question that the federal judicial system didn't need to answer because it was a political matter. Um, the decision only applied to claims of partisan gerrymandering, not racial gerrymandering. So part, partisan for like, oh, there are, there are more Republicans. We need to like grab this group of Republicans so we have a large, larger stronghold in this district and then like cut out the Democrats or vice versa. That's, that's what um, the Supreme Court ruled on, not when it comes to cutting out a political party. Um, state courts can still intervene and say, hey, this is not appropriate. Um, so Congress is built by their political parties, the committees that they form, congressional staff, the caucuses on in um, Congress, their rule proceedings, all of that. Um, let me see where are we at. Oh, hey man, I'm making hella quick progress. Okay, so real quick, um, the conference. Um, is for House Republicans, caucus is Democrats. It's literally the same thing, but they call them different names, which is frustrating when you're trying to remember what's what. So that's the party leadership So um, in each. So Speaker of the House is the majority party. So uh, like it, so Nancy Pelosi, she's the Speaker of the House because the Democrats are in charge and she's the leader for the Democratic Party. The Republicans, it would be, you know, their leader. Um, and they preside over the House of Representatives and they have the most influence on kind of what goes on the docket, what they focus on, that sort of thing. Majority leader um, is elected by the party and it's the second um, in charge after the speaker. So still by the majority party. Minority leader is exactly what it sounds like. And then there's an individual called the whip who coordinates legislative strategy, builds support and counts the votes. A uh, senator with greatest seniority is the president pro temp um, or the uh, vice president. The vice president is the tiebreaker and they can serve if they need to, they can be the tiebreaking vote for um, the Senate. So um, it's mostly ceremonial, the pro temp position. It's not really a big thing. Um, so the real power lies with the majority and minority leadership. So this lists the different types of committees, standing committees are permanent, select committees are um, semi-permanent, depending on what it is, same with um, the joint committees. And you can see here, I'm not gonna list all these, you guys can read as to like what examples are permanent and then temporary and as to why. Um, so select committees can't present bills, but they can hold hearings and say, hey, this is the problem you guys should list. 
and then um, standing committees can then take that up. So um, these are um, joint uh, committees where people from the House and the Senate come together to talk about these issues. Um, they gather information and then present it to Congress and say, hey, we need to talk about these matters. Um, and you can see the breakdown of that in your book. So that's not really a big deal. Staff agencies, not a big deal. So did I show you guys the I'm just a bill or did I just post it for y'all to look at? So I know we don't have time for that now, but look at the I'm just a bill that I've got listed as a video and that'll walk you through how a bill becomes a law and it's a lot clearer than the way the book reads it. Um, and it shortens this down significantly. We've talked about meeting with constituents, party discipline. We've discussed all of this multiple times. So you guys pretty well have it. I mean, we've talked about all of this multiple times. So, um, so yeah, that's Congress in a nutshell. It's a long chapter, but we've talked about like the party leadership and stuff a lot of times. So. So you guys are good on that, right? Are there any questions? I know that one was quick, but we've talked about some of that before. Yes. Oh, the answers. Yeah, ignore the answers. I don't know what, whoever was in charge of the answers. Is yeah, yeah. So we've done nine and 10 tonight. And I'm, I've already recorded seven and I'll send that to you this evening. I'll record eight probably tomorrow because I'm about to lose my voice. Um, and I'll send that tomorrow. I'll also go ahead and send you the study guide. So that way you know specifically what to focus on and what to ignore. So exam next week on seven through 10, two quizzes due next week. Keep working on your project. Yeah, seven and eight, which is what I recorded. Nine and 10, we just did tonight. <laughs> It's okay. You're going to have the study guide. Just follow the study guide and you will ace it. I promise. I will not give you anything that you can't excel in. Yes, just focus on the study guide and you'll be fine. I promise. Say, so, yeah, yeah. Well, ish. I'll let you guys know ahead of time because I want to make sure there's enough to cover each subject, but roughly, probably. Any more than that, I think people start shutting down. Seven yeah, <laughs> so we just did nine and 10. And then I've already recorded seven. I'm going to send to you guys tonight and I'm going to record eight tomorrow. And then, like I said, if there are any questions or something doesn't make sense, I'm available for Zoom or for emails or for whatever you need. And I'm going to give you a study guide tomorrow and you just follow the study guide and you'll be fine. Okay. Um, there was a little thing that I made on uh, line where I make little flashcards and I make